Good morning. Good morning. We're going to wait just a few more minutes for more folks to arrive and we'll get this started. Good morning, buenos dias. We will start in just one minute. Vamos a comenzar en un minuto. Okay, welcome to our third webinar in the Wola, Wola series, Decades of Damage Done, the Drug War Catastrophe in Latin America and the Caribbean, marking 50 years since US President Nixon launched a global war on drugs. Our first event discussed the big picture and set the scenes to follow. Uh, the second one focused on crop eradication. Both of those events were fantastic and are on our website. You can go listen to the recordings. And today's webinar is Criminalized and Incarcerated in Latin America, How the Drug War Drives the Region's Prison Crisis. First, a quick note on interpretation. Si está buscando traducción, favor de hacer clic en el botón al lado derecho abajo y escoger español. If you need interpretation, click on the interpretation button and choose your language of your preference. If you are following the live stream, you need to a unique translation. You can go to webs uh, to Wola's website. English. If you are listening on the live stream, I will be the only one speaking in English. So you will need interpretation. Please go to the WOLA events page, um, which is under Get Involved and register for the event, and you'll get the Zoom, you'll get the Zoom link. So going back to our webinar series, we're seeking to shed light on the tremendous harms caused by present punitive drug policies, and also point to the alternative approaches that are both more humane and more effective. And perhaps one of the most egregious harms caused by the so-called war on drugs is the dramatic increase in incarceration in countries across the region, due in large part to the exportation of the United States' draconian drug laws. The region's prisons are filled to bursting with people convicted of low-level drug offenses for excessive, excessive periods of time due to harsh sentencing policies. Women, people of color, Indigenous and others facing systematic inequalities are disproportionately impacted, while those profiting most from the drug trade are rarely put behind bars. We knew this to be the case when visiting prisons firsthand for our research, but the first report analyzing the relationship between drug laws and the region's prison overcrowding crisis was produced in 2010, the result of a research project coordinated by the Transnational Institute and WOLA. Shortly thereafter, the Colectivo de Estudios Drogas y Derecho <clears throat> said was formally constituted with researchers now in about 10 countries. SED has produced many reports since then, providing a strong and compelling body of research that you will hear about today. This webinar is not intended to focus only on women, though we will obviously talk about the disproportionate impact on women, but we do have an all female group of speakers. That is because there are so many amazing women working in this area. And I'm really excited about the group of people we pulled together today. So I'm just gonna jump right in uh, with some brief introductions and we'll get the ball rolling. First, for those who do not know me, I am Coletta Youngers, a senior fellow at WOLA, senior associate with the International Drug Policy Consortium, and also a consultant for the US-based National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. I have spent most of my now long professional career working on drug policy issues, more recently with a focus on women, drug policies and incarceration. Now for our speakers. Catalina Perez is a professor and currently works at CIDE in Mexico. Her research focuses on the study 
of legal procedures and practices specializing in the functioning of the criminal justice system, the justifications for and enforcement of criminal punishment, namely prisons, and the relation of criminal punishment with legitimacy and compliance. She is a member of SED, for which she has led numerous investigations on drug laws and incarceration in Mexico and in Latin America. Betty Maldonado is a formerly incarcerated activist and member of the Mexican Women's Collective, Women United for Liberty, which defends human rights inside and outside of prison. She is also a member of the regional network of formerly incarcerated women, the Latin American network of women resisting bringing down the bars. Juliana Borges is a Brazilian writer and researcher on criminal policy and um, is a Brazilian writer and research on criminal policy and racial relations at the Sao Paulo University, excuse me, Sao Paulo School of Sociology and Politics Foundation. She is an advisor for the Black Initiative for a New Drug Policy and the Brazilian Drug Policy Platform. A prominent activist and academic, she has done extensive research on the racial impact of drug policies in Brazil and is the author of two recent books, Mass Incarceration, published in 2019, and Prisons, Mirrors of Ourselves, published in 2020. Andrea Casamento's son was incarcerated in 2004 in Argentina at the age of 18, which prompted her to create ASIFAD, the Civil Association of Relatives of Detainees. ASIFAD today assists and empowers women relatives of incarcerated people and engages in advocacy to promote awareness about the effects of incarceration on families. ASIFAD is one of the founding organizations of REMOOF, an international network of women family members. And Andrea recently became a member of the UN Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture and Other Inhumane and Humiliating Treatment. It's the first time that a family member of a person deprived of liberty is sitting on that subcommittee. So that's really, really important. So before we kick this off, just a few more housekeeping items. We're gonna have a limited time for Q&A. Um, you can put your questions uh, via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Questions can be asked in English or Spanish. Um, if you're watching on the live screen, stream, you can put questions in the chat. If you joined us late and do not speak Spanish, interpretation into English is available in the Zoom link. Um, go to the button at the bottom right of your screen and select English. Si han recién uh, ajuntado al webinario, deberían escoger tu idioma en, uh, con el botón al lado derecho. Please choose the language of your preference with the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, our speakers and I have agreed that I will say one minute when they've got one, one minute left to speak, so you'll hear me do that, and then um, I will let people know when it's time to, to finish because uh, we want to make sure everybody has a time uh, to, 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 to participate equally and to have a little bit of time for Q&A. So with that, let's kick it off with Catalina. Catalina, you and I are both part of the research team said, which I just referred to in my opening remarks. Perhaps one of the most important value, values of SED's um, or value added of SED's research is that we're able to take a comparative approach. Our research is designed precisely so that we are collecting similar data from different countries, allowing us to develop a regional analysis. What does the said research show about the adoption of harsh drug laws across the region and its impact on incarceration? What, does, what has this meant for those who consume drugs and how has that changed over the last decade? And just one last reminder to our speakers um, to please speak uh, slowly because we do to facilitate the interpretation. Okay, Catalina, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Coleta. I'm going to speak in Spanish because it's easier for me, but I would like to thank Coleta for her invitation, Walla for organizing this event. And also, um, thank you for, for the honor to be with all the colleagues that are here with me today. I've met them in other spaces, and it's a true privilege to be here today. The work that SED carries out, as Coleta said, is the SED is a group of researchers located in different countries in Latin America. Our methodology is the following. We choose one topic that has to do with drug policy, and we analyzed it, and not only in terms of our countries, but at a regional level. So we've collected information that we can compare among the different countries, and that has allowed us to understand 
that problems that sometimes take place in Mexico do not affect only Mexico. They also affect Argentina, Venezuela, Colombia, and so on and so forth. So we're talking, in fact, about regional problems, not domestic ones. And that allows us to reach different solutions, find different solutions than if we focused only at a national level. Answering your question, Coleta, there are many different things that we've analyzed in the set. Maybe one of the most important uh, studies in terms of the drug policy was the one that we did that had to do with drug users and the use of drugs. One of the things that we identified when we analyze the use of substances was the following. While all countries say that the use of illicit substances is not illegal, drug users continue to be criminalized and put in prison. So what we started to see was the legal mechanisms that allow for this to happen. And we found the following. We found out the following. Using drugs is not a crime in any of the countries, but all the different things that you need to do in order to get to that use um, is illegal. The most penalized one, the most criminalized thing um, is basically possession. So what the law says, using drugs is not a crime, but if I carry an illegal substance, then that is a crime and that's regulated in different ways. We found, in, we found that in many countries, you have a crime which is to possess drugs, to carry drugs with you. And that comes with a three to five year sentence, depending on the country and the government or the state. If they find a person carrying drugs, they could be put in prison without any additional evidence. So it's important to say here that we need to find different solutions to this situation, to this punitive system to, that punishes uh, drug users. We've also seen in our said studies with these kinds of rules that it's the drug laws are continuing to be a way in which the states are trying to uh, cover up with the inefficiencies of the prosecuting system. They might uh, arrest a young person who may or may not commit another crime, but they perceive them as dangerous. And with the excuse of drugs, they end up in jail. So there's this whole stigma uh, and there's a very selective way in which the drug laws are applied so that they disproportionately affect young people who have a small amount of an illicit substance or uh, consumers of small amounts of any kind of drug that end up in the in jail. The other relevant thing has been the growth of the prison system in Latin America. And I'll end with this from 2005 to 2015. In one of the studies that we did, we were able to see how the penitentiary population has increased. In the United States, you can there's been a 16% growth in uh, jail population, but uh, the population of those jailed has grown more than 100%. So there has been growth both on the sanctions uh, applied to the different kinds of drug infractions, as well as to different behaviors. There's new behaviors that are included in the penal called codes and in, women are being jailed at a much higher rate than before. If we take women separately, women are definitely being jailed more than they used to be. And there's a disproportional way in which Latin American drug laws are being applied. In Mexico, the sanctions for transporting drugs uh, the law presents itself as being gender neutral, but when we see how it's applied, we're seeing that men and women are uh, committing different infractions and they have different roles in the, the whole chain of actions in the illicit market. And there's and there are the nonviolent crimes that women who are unarmed, uh, single mothers often, they are the ones who are often involved in transportation. And the sanctions there are much higher than for people who are actually supplying the drugs. So women are spending a lot of time in jail 
more than men. And so what that is showing is that there's internal injustices in the system. And finally, it's very important, and we have studied this as well, is that the conditions in the jails in Latin America uh, are affected by the drug laws in a negative way. In almost all of the countries of Latin America, there's overcrowding, there's very difficult conditions, there's a prevalence of illnesses like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, hep hepatitis, now COVID, uh, lice, but there's a much higher prevalence inside jails than outside. And so what ends up happening is that in order to, to supposedly protect people's health, we put young people who often, the on, their only crime has been that they've possessed a small amount of drugs uh, but to supposedly protect their health or protect the health of the public, we're putting them in jail. The conditions in jail are terrible. Their health then be becomes at risk, as well as the health of their family members. And Betty has been working on this, and she can talk about the perspective of the families where there's a high cost as well. So drug crimes in Latin America have uh, put an immense pressure on the prison systems, and it affects disproportionately and unequally of um, affecting more the vulnerable sectors like women and young people who are coming from marginal areas of the cities. And all of this because there's supposed benefit that we then, in fact, don't ever see. Now, I didn't want to go over my time, and so uh, I'll end here. Thank you. Well, you still have a, a minute. And, and I think you you really highlighted one of the um, you know ag most egregious aspects of this, which is how drug laws stigmatize and criminalize um, people who use drugs. And um, I think your um, comments about the increased incarceration of women lead nicely to our our next speaker. You know, I actually first got involved in um, thinking about what well, what got me to become so um, passionate about working on issues of women's incarceration in Latin America was actually that first said report that we did in 2010, where we had decided we would look at different um, sectors. You know, foreign people and foreigners in prison, women, etc. And I was just astounded looking at the you know not the sheer numbers because obviously there are a lot more men in prison than women. But if you looked at the rate of women's incarceration, how rapidly it was increasing, and that, of course, has continued to today, over a decade later, and then look at the percentages, because if it's, you know, generally what our research and said has found is that maybe 25, 20 to 30 percent of the male prison population is there for drug offenses, um, depending obviously on the country. But in the case of women, it is often 40, 60, in, even at times 80 percent of the female prison population is there for drug offenses. And that is, there's just something fundamentally wrong with that picture. Um, so let's turn now to Betty um, and, and to the impact of punitive drug policies on the lives of those directly affected. Betty, you are part of a growing movement of women in Mexico and across Latin America that have been deprived of liberty and are now speaking out about that experience. Can you please share with us how incarceration impacted your lives while being held behind bars and also about the reality that formerly incarcerated women face coming out of prison? Yes, thank you very much for the invitation and good morning to everyone. Unfortunately, on, inside the prisons, as people have said, that the law is very punitive. Instead of protecting us, the law criminalizes us. Personally, I was in jail for crimes against health, and uh, they said I had cannabis, they said I had cocaine. And a controlled medicines. When uh, there were 30 of those medicines named, I was very afraid because it was uh, one year for every uh, item. So I was afraid they were going to give me 30 years. And then, of course, uh, cocaine and marijuana is punished separately as well. In our country here in Mexico, what's happened is that they've been criminalizing women a lot. Uh, 
And so when uh, people are criminalized because of ignorance, uh, poverty grows. We believe in our laws uh, and sometimes we the time that I was in jail was terrible, terrible, because I was seeing how families were suffering, complete families, grandmothers, daughters, and granddaughters. When I was there, there was a family of 10 women who came, a 75-year-old grandmother with her daughter and granddaughters were all in jail. and. As time went by, they were freed, but there was a whole process of a, about a year, and um, the women were being released little by little. And they found them at a family party, and there was a whole police operation, and that was when we were pretty much in this failed war against drug. And so they paid a thousand pesos to each policeman to find criminals. And that's what I was told that they get 5,000, anywhere between a thousand and 5,000 pesos for each person that they're able to take to jail. And so in jail with me, there were children, there were young, girls under 18, I was charged with uh, transport, uh, narco retail, corruption of children, and my families, family members are really involved at a very, very low level, but everything was considered a crime. They said that we were selling activo, but that was the material with which we were working. And in jail, we started telling our stories and we were talking about 30 or 40 percent of women who were in there for crimes against health. So uh, retail sales, transportation or just because they were consumers because unfortunately here in Mexico the laws are not respected very well when someone is an addict they're not uh, seen positively in the public ministry and they charge you with possession with crimes against health uh, narco retail. There were a lot of places at that time where drugs were being sold. And I didn't really explain how is it possible that when I was in jail being charmed, uh, charged with crimes against health, um, I said, well, you know, drugs exist. I was jailed and I was sentenced, but they even sell drugs inside the prison. So the 22 people that uh, sat down and talked with me were released little by little. And my child's father and my son and I had the longer sentences. I was taken to the Islas Marias in the Pacific Ocean. And the president at the time decided to make those islands a federal prison. And our human rights were violated. We were humi humiliated. Instead of doing justice or having any kind of reconciliation between the state and incarcerated people, we went through a terrible process and we were criminalized. And that was during the Calderon government. We were a trophy for him. And the conditions in the jails are terrible in every way, in every way, food, medicine, you lose everything when you go to jail. 
And what happens is there's also a um, situation where our lawyers are at fault. They say, go ahead and plead guilty, say you're addict, say you're illiterate. And so I said all of those things, but instead of having an adequate defense, it didn't work for me at all. Also, they jail family members with us because even if they're not there physically with us, they are suffering so much because they know their family members are in jail and they have to try to bring us food and medicine and shoes. A lot of people are still jailed and in our uh, collective of women, United for the Human Rights of Women who are jailed, um, we're trying to help each other in this way. I think we're moving ahead. The situation with them is terrible, but we're continuing to try to help our sisters and we feel like we're family. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betty, for that presentation. Um, I think it's just um, so incredible how in recent years, women like yourselves have been willing to confront the stigma and discrimination that um, anyone coming out of prison faces, but particularly women coming out of prison who are seen as having defied the gender roles that society has assigned to them. They face even worse stigma and discrimination. And of course, all of the problems that one confronts trying to rebuild their lives after being separated from their families with criminal records and unable to find employment, finding a place to live. Um, it's just really inspiring how you are coming together um, to, to raise awareness about this. Um, we'll talk more about that when we, when we get to the next question. I just wanna mention one other thing that you said that has stayed with me, which is that people, that, that police are being paid 5,000 soles per person that they detain. I mean, we see these kinds of quotas in law enforcement, but that just puts such a human face on it um, that um, you know, so many people will end up in prison that way. It's just really, Mind blowing, that's all I can say. Um, there is a question in the chat to you, Catalina, about where um, some of the documents that you referred to can be found. The said reports um, are on our website, which is www.drogasydrecho.org, period org. We are having some difficulties with the web page right now, I'll warn you, which we hope to get fixed soon. And maybe Catalina, when you speak again, you could mention um, other places that people can find um, your, your incredible wealth of, of research. Um, and now I'll turn to Juliana, um, because the collateral damage on the war on drugs in Brazil has been enormous. Brazil has one of the worst prison overcrowding situations in the region and the data on drug-related uh, extrajudicial executions by members of security forces is simply staggering. And as is the case in the United States, there is a clear racial dimension with black people more likely to be the victims of punitive drug policies. Juliana, you've done a lot of research on this topic. Um, so can you please tell us in eight minutes, I know it's hard to condense it all into eight minutes, but can you please tell us about the nexus between drug policies and race in Brazil? Hi, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you, Coleta. Greetings, Catalina, Betty, Andrea. In Brazil, there is a problem. The, and people think that the racial debate is something that has nothing to do with the reality in the country as if racism had been overcome and it's a discussion that is important. But data says that 63% of uh, the population in Brazil is, uh, of the, the population in prisons is uh, Afro and we represent the third largest population in prison in the world. I think we have to remember this in 2019, 42,000 people were killed in the country. 90% of those people were young and among them, 75% were 
Afro, we're black. In other words, we are talking about one black, black young person every 23 minutes. Evidence shows that seven, it's 75 percent of the poorest population and 61 percent of the victims that are being killed are black in Brazil. It's important to highlight something. Every year, every year, the mortality among white people decreases, but in black people, it, it increases. Basically, the security policy is not failing. They're following a genocide project within our society. So we can establish a lot of similarities when we say that the punitive system in our countries in the criminal systems of our countries cannot be analyzed without thinking what society has undergone. Our criminal justice systems are based on domination and maintaining inequality. I therefore believe that the criminal justice system is closely related to ra racism and it permeates all levels and it leads to this oppression structure. But everything was reorganized to guarantee that racism stayed and their inequalities based on that racial hierarchy. An example, the reform of the criminal law in 1971 is an example. The peace judge figure was eliminated. It was a person that was going to mediate local conflicts. In our society, we see the consequences of colonialism and now punitive measures are guided by generalized rules with very little or no relation to the groups on which they have a daily impact. In other words, I can say that punitive systems are mirrors of society through a criminal policy that maintains the power of the state. Or when we analyze the profile of people in prison, we see the same educational, societal, economic flaws of society. Therefore, the population is increasing in prisons. We're talking about more than 750,000 people. We rank number three with the highest number of people in prison in the world. There are a lot of cultural issues in Brazil. 64% of people in prison is black, like I said, and around 30% are in prison because of drug-related crimes. In the pandemic, the situation is extremely difficult. In Brazilian prisons, all in recommendations by organization, organizations such as the UN, the National Council of Justice also were ignored. They issued recommendations and they ignored all of them. The pandemic exacerbated all the problems that already existed in prisons. Uh, there were already problems with overcrowding, with the structures. So the situation was truly precarious. For you to understand the situation, a person in prison has 35 more time, more thirty-five times more chances of um, get, for example, TB than a regular citizen. I'm going to quote Angela Davis. She says that prisons are the location of the waste of capitalism. We are seeing a lot of black people die, and this is part of the genocide project. Our communities are more increasingly more militarized and insecurity prevails. And this is because this context 
maintains very precarious situations and it really affects com communities that are extremely vulnerable in this situation. I think that what justice systems are doing is criminalizing basically precarious situations, gender, race, poverty. Therefore, in terms of race and the war on drugs, in Brazil, we see a direct relation. It's inseparable. Those two things come hand in hand. You can't have a serious discussion without mentioning both issues. You can't talk about the drug on wars if, we, if you don't think about the racial aspect of it, because it is the Afro population that is dealing with all the consequences of this genocide. Thank you very much. Um, I think your presentation really gets to the roots or what I see as behind punitive drug policies, which have to do very much with the legacy of colonialism, of racism, of patriarchy, and of capitalism and how um, certain sectors of society are sought to be controlled by those with economic and, and political power. Very powerful presentation, thank you. Um, we will turn now to Andrea Casamento. Incarceration does not just impact those behind bars. It's devastating for their families and for female family members in particular wives, partners, mothers, sisters, as they are the ones who both visit and provide basic necessities to their family members in prison, as well as take on responsibilities as sole heads of households or for the children of incarcerated parents. And I think this is often very overlooked by people who are looking at drug policies. What is the impact on the families of people in prison? So you were one of the first persons, Andrea, that um, I am aware of that began an organization of family members of incarcerated people. Um, what are the challenges that family members face, <clears throat> excuse me, that led you to launch ASIFAD? And it would be interesting to, to have a, also a, a more regional perspective. What have you found in other countries? Are there more similarities or differences among family members of people deprived of liberty? Bueno. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you today. Thank you, Coleta. Thank you, Walla, for your invitation. I fully agree with everything that has been said so far. The issue is that the impact is not only on the incarcerated person, but also on the relatives. We see that those that are arrested, those that are in prison are most of the times poor. So we're talking about poor families that have to take care of the rest of the, of the family that stayed in the house, providing foods, providing medi medicine, everything that you need to provide for the people in the house and also for the person that is in prison and something else that has to do with the legal process. It is the relatives, most of the times women that go to court to request justice, to try to understand the system, which is extremely difficult because you're not used to it until you are involved one way or another. And then you got to bring everything that you found out to the person that it has been put in prison. What happened to me was that when I was in line as a relative of someone in prison, I thought that there would be some sort of space where relatives could actually go to and ask all their questions in Argentina. And then I found out that the same thing happened in the region. Those spaces really don't exist. Relatives are the suspected ones, the mistreated ones, the bad mothers. So you did something wrong and that's why your son is in prison. We made the wrong choice. And that's why our relative is in prison. Basically, given the lack of spaces where we could ask questions, um, 
women that were waiting in line to ask questions decided to organize this type of association. We did, we weren't fully aware of what the shape of the organization would be. At the beginning, we just met to cry, basically, to vent. And there was a friend who knew a little bit more about the doors that we needed to knock. And she started sharing that information uh, within the rest of the group. And little by little, we started empowering ourselves and we started to learn that we had the right to know, that we could ask questions and that we could actually make the demands. Today, our organization is a well-known organization. We work 24 seven, we support the relatives, we get phone calls from prison. But the most important thing is that we always continue to demand the state to do what they had to do. It's, we're not meant to be to doing that. It's the state that needs to change those punitive policies. If the state, if the a person is sent to prison, they have to take care of that person, and they cannot delegate everything on us. After the damage caused by being in prison, when someone goes back to their home that person needs to be supported so that they can reintegrate in society and that is all, something that is always delegated to the relatives and the relatives do whatever they can obviously to manage given this situation thank you to coleta and another organization which is also an international network which is the napis platform we started to bring visibility to how these things affect children too. When we think about children, we normally think of children that are in prison with their mothers. In Argentina, we have 150,000 children affected by incarceration one way or another. Their parents or their caregivers are in prison and no one is taking them into account. criminal law, different institutions, no one is thinking about these children. In addition to be, or as, as we formed this platform, we started participating in events. We were invited by WOLA. We started contacting organizations and spaces that work on the same issues in other countries. And I started realizing in this way that I wasn't the one who had done everything wrong, that it wasn't my uh, friends in Argentina who had done everything wrong, that it was a systemic problem because all of us are hearing the same stories with different accents. In Brazil, the same thing's happening. Mexico, it's the same. And it's true, this is a pioneer organization, um, but now there is an organization in Brazil and we were all talking the same language. So it occurred to us that we should go around and talk to various groups. And at the beginning of this year, we've started to form an international network of organizations of family members and women. So, um, we started finding a lot of different realities. And I started thinking in something that Betty was saying, like who uh, brings drugs into the jails? Because this is what is we're seeing as well, that sometimes the family members say, well, thank God that he's in jail and he's not dead because, you know, with all of his consumption, he could have died. but. We know that there are drugs in jail, and we know uh, people whose children have died from consuming drugs in jail. So who gets these drugs into the jail? How can it be that in these places where people should receive some education and health care, that in these very places they can die from overdose? This 
is what the family members are trying to make visible. One minute. So we want to be able to ask ourselves, well, sorry, I guess I'll just uh, leave it there and I'll talk some more after the next question. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. It's very impressive what you have been able to do by gathering together in an international network. And we will get back to that point in the next round of questions. <laughs> um, so I'd just like to um, underscore that so many studies show that those in prison who maintain strongly strong family ties are much more likely to be able to succeed um, to rebuild their lives coming out of prison. Yet we see in country after country, and starting with my own country, the United States, how prison systems are set up to keep families apart, to break those ties um, in so many different ways. And just um, one that was I was thinking about as you were talking, Andrea, is the humiliating treatment that family members have to go through to get into prison. And, um, you know, from body searches, um, you know, just humiliating treatment, women having to strip naked, children having to have their private parts examined before going in to see their parents. That it's just, it, it's unfathomable to me why anybody could think that is okay um, in this day and age. And so I think that the work that the family members are doing also in the United States where we have a strong movement of, of children and family members of people in prison to try and change those practices is, is so very important. Um, we're gonna turn now to the next round of questions. Um, I think we're good on time. So please do be uh, putting questions in the chat. Um, well, we're pretty good on time, I should say. Um, I see that there's one on corruption, which we'll come back to, um, perhaps another one now. Um, so for the second round of questions, we're gonna have shorter responses, and we're gonna turn from looking at the impact of present drug policies to addressing opportunities and proposals for reform. And I'm gonna come back to start with you again, Catalina, and returning to said. Its significant body of research clearly indicates that present drug policies are not achieving the stated objectives of reducing drug markets and yet do a great deal of damage. In the absence of more significant um, drug poly policy reforms at the international level, much of SED's work is focused on mitigating the damage. So what can you tell us about SED's principal recommendations to governments for reducing drug-related incarceration and drug policy reform more broadly? Thank you, Coleta. Here we have really done a lot of studies, and I won't be able to cover all of them in this time, but maybe we'll be able to answer some questions later. One of the topics that I was mentioning before is the use of the possession crimes, especially simple possession crimes. And I wanted to go back to that point because what that crime does is it, or the, the way that crime is described is that perhaps there's a certain amount of drugs that could be tolerated in Mexico. If you have five grams of cannabis or less, it's not a crime. But if you have more, it is a crime, but you don't go directly to jail. There's this whole investigation process. But if you have more than five grams of cannabis, and it's not for sale, it's considered simple possession. And there's a three-year prison sentence for that. So this is the mechanism by which many young people end up in jail, young people who really didn't commit any crimes at all. And what we have said in said is that this crime of simple possession should just be eliminated. Uh, prosecutors, police, public ministries, have the obligation, according to the Constitutional Court in Colombia, to show the intention of sale before punishing a person. These uh, crimes are simply sanctioning possession as if possession itself was uh, 
dangerous as if you were driving drunk. No, this is something that should be eliminated completely. The other thing has to do with the use of thresholds. It doesn't exist in all countries, but many countries use the idea of thresholds where you set a certain amount of drugs where there's no uh, sanction below that amount, but it, above that amount, it's considered higher a problem and perhaps even up to drug trafficking. And uh, there are some measures that are adopted to avoid the discretionality on the part of judges. And so to the, the problem is that the thresholds are used to try to um, make up for the lack of efficiency of the prosecutors and the police. So you have thresholds below which you are considered a consumer and you can't sanction those person who have less than a certain amount. But that shouldn't mean that if you have a little bit above that amount, you are immediately treated as a criminal. The authorities should uh, be able to prove the intent to sale and to supply. So the thresholds should be determined uh, by what consumers actually do and not for example, in cocaine in Mexico, the threshold for consumption there is a half a gram and the minimal doses sold in the market is one gram. So anybody that buys any cocaine at all is going to be above the threshold. And so it's considered a, a drug uh, sale crime as well. And so these laws should all be changed to reflect the actual practices of what consumers are doing. The other topic has to do with proportionality. We've done a lot of studies on the proportionality of sentencing and what's, we're seeing some of the things that I was saying before. Why do women spend more time in jail? Because they're supposing the neutrality of the system, but they're not really looking at how it works and the role of each person or the various groups of people. So this whole thing has to be reviewed, not just to understand the different roles of men and women in young people and people of certain sectors, but also the disproportionality that exists right now in terms of the sentencing of people in these crimes against health. 25 years for transporting. Why is that disproportional? Because when we see um, crimes of rape, sometimes they even do less years for something like rape. So I think there has to be a general review of the harm that is uh, trying to be avoided. And finally, this is not just a, not a recommendation from said necessarily, but I think more than trying to improve uh, jail conditions, we need to use jails less. Jails are not the best way to deal with these things. And of course, there are international treaties that say that we can't do away with jailing completely, but there should be a review of constitutionality of the international treaties on uh, the subject of drugs because there's good legal arguments that can be used to show that most of the drug laws that are being applied are unconstitutional and uh, looking at international treaties themselves. So there are ways in which we can do reviews in each one of the countries. And the international treaties could simply be ignored, but in the United States and Uruguay and Canada, and even in Mexico, we need to start reviewing the ways in which we can change internally to ab abandon the punitive system as the primary response to drug use or for the uh, production and transportation of small amounts of drugs. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. You said it best. Prison does not work in these cases. It is not, and, and the punitive approach has dramatically failed to impact drug markets. Um, it has not made uh, people healthier. It's, um, I'll stop there uh, so we can go on to the next question, but um, I think you really expressed well the need for an alternative um, approach. And quick shout out to Eric Sterling. Great question. We'll get to it um, as soon as we're through with this round of questions. So Betty, now turning to you, 
one of the most exciting developments in recent years, as I mentioned before, has been this development of a regional women, uh, uh, a regional network of women, women who've been in prison, um, the Latin American network of women resisting bringing down the bars. And this has happened, you know, this whole thing started, you know, in around 2019. So it's a really gone very quickly, a really exciting new development. And Mexico has really been at the forefront, at the vanguard of this, and now has some six organizations founded and led by formerly incarcerated women, including your own organization, um, Women United for Liberty. So please tell us about why formerly incarcerated women are coming together, um, confronting the stigma and speaking out, and what you are trying to achieve. Yes, what we're trying to do with this movement and the Latin American network is uh, for our authorities to stop criminalizing us and stigmatizing us. Unfortunately, when we leave prison, we leave without documents, we leave without jobs, we leave often without family, because sometimes when you go to jail, you lose your family, your husband marries again, um, you're left to the side. And so I think all of the of us who have been in this situation have a lot in common if we've been in jail. So what we're seeing is that everything is lined up against us right now, especially as women, as women who were in jail, as women who were sentenced and forgotten. Everything is lined up against us right now. There's not a social fabric that we can depend on. There's not a, a job process to get us back into society. So we have to start everything from zero. And we face discrimination from society. Sometimes it, it seems as if we have the, the letter C for incarceration tattooed on us the way that we are looked at. And, Fortunately, we have eight penitentiary centers that are private jails as well. And as Catalina was saying, there shouldn't be any jails at all, but I think especially those of us who are uh, deprived of liberty it happens all too often because somebody is making money off of us because we are a business. The penitentiary system has become a business. It's really hard to find people to help us, even with identification. So we're trying to tell authorities all of this in the city of Mexico. And we're trying to make sure that people who are in jail can receive the tools necessary uh, to avoid a recidivism. If there is no support, if there is no help, obviously people, especially women, are going to be exposed to criminal groups and it's going to be hard to escape drug sales and prostitution and to turn, uh, return to jail again. So in Santa Marta and in Mexico, we found uh, two young women who had just been released from jail, jail, but they went back in again very soon. Why? Because they were committing some of the same crimes. And so what are we asking as a collective, as an organization? We want the state to make the conditions of women who leave prison more visible and to provide more support for us. We need tools for better social reception. In Mexico, there is no place for women to go if they have just been released from jail and they can't go back home. So they end up on the streets. And so we need support and uh, because there's too many people out there waiting to abuse women when they come out of jail. So we have structural uh, problems and we need structural solutions and comprehensive solutions. Right now, we're also working to see the inefficiencies in the criminal processes where some people are being tortured and there's also um, some people who have been jailed for more than 50 years. So in the Latin American network, we're looking at all of these inefficiencies on the part of our governments and our uh, criminal justice system. 
so that changes can be made. If people are in jail and have been in jail for more than 50 years um, because of these supposed crimes against health, and that is true in many cases. We need to let some of these folks out. There's an amnesty law in Mexico, but it really doesn't work at all. It's a catalog and nothing else. It doesn't work at all. The law doesn't work. No one has been released since last year. No, I'm lying. Five women. Hi, women were released. They committed crimes against health, but in reality, not even the presidential decree works in Mexico to release women that are in prison for crimes they did not commit or very minor crimes, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betty. Um, it's really exciting what you all are, are doing together. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Juliana. Um, Juliana, Brazil is not only a country ravaged by the war on drugs, it's also a country where civil society organizations and social movements have developed creative forms of resistance. The Brazilian Platform for Drug Policy Reform, which brings together groups from around the country, is a good example, as are Black movement organizations such as the United Black Movement and the Anti-Racist Front. My question for you is, how have these racial movements incorporated the work of the drug policy reform, excuse me, how have these racial movements incorporated the drug war into their political agendas? And what impact have they had on the work of the drug policy reform movement? And please speak to the role of black women who have, had a, have really been at the vanguard of these debates in Brazil. I turn it over to you, Juliana. Sí, claro. In terms of racist violence, it's always been something that Afro activists have worked on. There is a very famous uh, samba musician in Brazil called Da Silva. And he, in the 70s, was already saying that drug use, especially weed, was only criminalized when it was used by black people. In Brazil, we see also the history of criminalization of weed, cannabis, uh, in relation to Brazilian racism. However, this debate started to gain momentum in an articulated manner when young black leaders were trained and they promoted the agenda of talking about genocide in Brazil in a movement in 2000, and, in 2000 that expanded and spread in 2007. They demanded that the fight against genocide, or they said that the fight against genocide was the most important issue for young people and in terms of public policy. Therefore, active engagement by young black leaders in the different consultative councils uh, created by government by the government was when we saw a lot of engagement and we thought there there would be spaces to promote the agenda of social movements however they also sanctioned one of the most punitive laws um, in terms of incarcerated people in Brazil. These councils, these consultative councils were created to analyze the relationship between the institutions that were working on drug policy, but without relating it to race. Therefore, the participation of black leaders of the different movements were included in the agenda and that strengthened the Brazilian platform on drug policy. It was done at a federal level and they were they had mem members that were working on human rights and that was in line with an agenda that was strengthened by universities and research also led by black activists. For me, those were the different components that brought momentum to all this. All this whole process was led and coordinated by Black women. And when we think about the main 
organizers of the black population encompassing more than 70 black organizations we're talking mostly about black women the agendas of um, for example uh, relatives of people that are deprived from liberty we're talking about women here too and this is not a surprise black women understand that their freedom their life possibility is closely related to their community as a whole these women position themselves as articulators of public life. Uh, and this is a very clear dynamic in our communities. It's women, the ones that are leading the movements and all these processes. They are the leaders. A few years ago, we couldn't think of black organizations that could play a direct and objective role that would have an impact on the current criminal policy. It would be a project against the war on drugs and it would relate it uh, to race. And now I can actually name several, but I'm going to focus on just a few uh, as an example. The Iniciativa Negra para una Nueva Política de Drogas, the Red Nacional de Feministas Antiprohibicionistas, El Instituto de Defensa de la Población Negra. Oh, this is an organization with black lawyers. And then a network that I'm creating with other women, with black women in the Americas, to discuss criminal policies from an black feminist perspective and then there is also an association called ellas existen mujeres encarceladas and these are just to name a few a few years back this this would have been unthinkable but now we have many organizations led by women we've seen a big change in this regard in the black movements and black led organizations historically um, this is a massive change. Now they're talking about how to build other law uh, parameters, uh, have new policies. Humanity always used different substances, right? So how we talk about, so we talk about all these policies and how important it is not to criminalize these people, people that have been historically marginalized, discriminated against in Brazil. Black women and also indigenous women play a key role in this discussion about criminal policies and the war on drugs. Thank you very much, Juliana. Turn now to Andrea um, for the last intervention, and we'll, we should still have um, a bit of time for the Q and A. Andrea, in your first intervention, you spoke of the you know the new international network of organizations of family members of people deprived of liberty, um, or RAMUF, which now has organizations from seven countries. You've led the process to create this network. Please tell us more about its creation what the network's objectives are, and what you hope to achieve working together. Yes, we are talking about seven countries, El Salvador, Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Spain, specifically Catalonia, a region within Spain. We try to be as encompassing as possible. One of the objectives of the network has to do with amplifying our voices. It's about bringing visibility to the role played by relatives and everything that, for example, that Betty was talking about. When someone gets out of prison, there are no policies in place to support these people. And it's basically the relatives uh, of those that had been in prison 
uh, that have to support them. If the person deprived from liberty uh, actually has any relatives, women play a key role. Women are the ones going to prison, coming out. Those are the relatives that go and visit those in prison. They are the ones that know what's happening inside. So, and I think their voices are not taken into account. That's why we're focusing on them, on amplifying their vo voices. And the role played by the relatives is not only about bringing food to the person in prison, but to do everything else that I mentioned before. While the person is in prison, one of the objectives of the network is to do advocacy work and see how from the outside we can bring visibility to all the violations of human rights. And I fully agree with Catalina and everyone here today, prisons are useless. You can't really do anything good putting anyone in jail. You can't think that you're going to change people's behavior by putting them in cages. That's not how you solve a problem. If we need to learn to live in freedom, we need to learn living in freedom. I, as part of the subcommittee and regarding what Catalina was talking about and different international treaties, and I do agree, there's a lot of work to be done in that regard. Maybe, I don't know what's gonna happen, but my, intention, my objective within the subcommittee is to actually open up their perspective. We cannot only see whether the Van Gogh rules are being implemented or not, if the windows are bigger or smaller. Uh, we can also look a little farther. Our obligation as members of the subcommittee is not only to monitor, is also to issue recommendations to the countries. And we can expand our horizon and see what recommendations we could actually issue. Also, both with the family organization and the subcommittee, although the subcommittee does have another function, which is to strengthen local mechanisms, and local mechanisms must have a direct link with family organization in spaces like the one that Betsy works with. And starting with that dialogue, they can see, we can see how to do advocacy in each country. This is a little bit of our intention and what I hope to do as part of my role on the subcommittee. What other thing? I also, well, I wanted to tell you that, and I wanted to say that sometimes you have to go out beyond the standards. We have three networks now. We have the network of women who were jailed. We have the network of family members um, and the network and, and the ones who are in jail are the victims that so we're adding the network of family members. And from the place where we are from each of our networks are going to try to give visibility to this situation. And I think we just have to be creative and a little bit more daring from the places where we are to um, be a little more daring. I don't think right now we know what the solution is, but I'm very happy to be on the way and to be making efforts. Thank you very much, Andrea. Very, very well put. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes now. Um, we can go just a few minutes over for Q&A. Um, I just wanna point out that Catalina did put some uh, sources, uh, citations in the chat, the Q&A chat in response to the, to the first question. Um, there's, uh, I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna do is um, summarize some of the questions. Re we read out some of the questions we have in the chat and then give each speaker um, just about three minutes um, to respond to whatever part of 
those questions you would like to, um, to respond to. So um, there are two questions by Kathy Bauer. Um, one is any idea any ideas to uh, about ways to address corruption such as that found in Betty's speech where police were paid. I'm happy to say we're going to have a whole ses session on a whole webinar on corruption as part of this series. I'll say more about that when we wrap up. But if anybody else would like to address that, they can. Um, and then um, there's a I thought there was another question by you, Kathy, but I don't see it here. Um, and then there's a whole series of very good questions by Eric Sterling. I would um, really encourage people to look at them. I, I wanna pull out um, a couple of these um, uh, for folks to focus on. And, and I'll just read the first one. The fear generated about the dangers, narcotics and other drugs by medical, legal, religious and political elites goes back 100 years and more. The international treaties to require states to outlaw the non-medical possession and distribution of drugs are more than 100 years old. In your countries, to what extent is reform of drug laws blocked by popular opinion? And to what extent is it blocked by the economic, economic benefit to the police and prison industries? Or is reform obstructed by other forces in society? What do you think is necessary to overcome these obstacles in each of your countries? That's a huge question, um, but I think one of the issues that we see so prevalent in Latin America is this idea that mano duro policies or um, you know, hardline policies <clears throat> will help solve um, either very real or often perceived problems of public insecurity. So how does that factor into, um, into, um, into responses in your countries? And then Eric asks another, uh, or how does that play into support for, um, for these kinds of hardline poli policies and punitivism in, in your countries? And I think a lot of what we've been trying to do is change those, those views, those narratives, um, change the way people view um, uh, people who, who use drugs and people who are in prison, et cetera. Anyway, um, and then I wanna pick up one thing that Eric said in a later question, which is something that we've all been very concerned about. So many women and men are put in prison for drug offenses, but what we find with women is the overuse of tranquilizers and other forms of medication um, while they're in prison. I don't know, Betty or Andrea, if you can, um, if you can uh, address that issue and how um, these drugs um, are ostensibly uh, used for women's health, but in fact end up um, uh, as a, it's a way of, of controlling them. And of course, all of the implications that has for women. It's a huge issue in this country. Um, and let me just look, there's one, a few more questions. This one I think is for Catalina, ¿por qué la política carcelaria sigue insistiendo en colocar al frente de la... Why does jail policy continue to have profiles? Why does people that work there have military and police profiles rather than experts on the topic of drug addiction and conception? My name is David Aredaño. I'm a police person in Ecuador. And this question is how does Catherine Hurd, does the panel have views on how academic researchers can best engage with grassroots organizations to convey the impact of patriarchal drug enforcement policies on women and oppressed communities? Should the focus be on law reform at national level or something else? Support for women leaving prison is important as Betty has explained, but how can we stop their numbers increasing in the first place? Is it about providing extent of recidivism with hard data? And does that data exist? Big questions. Um, sorry to throw them all out there, but I wanted to, to, they're all good questions. I wanted to get them on the table. Um, I'm gonna go in the order that uh, we started with. Um, as I said, try to keep your responses to three or four minutes. Catalina, there's a few more, one extra one for you. Um, so Catalina, let's start with you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so. Okay, I'm going to start with Eric's questions. The question about reforms and why these reforms aren't happening, I think Coletta gave part of the response, but it has to do with this problem as associating drug use with crime. And when you, you see this all over the 
continent. And when you actually do surveys of people in jail in Mexico and what kind of substances they're using, et cetera, we find two things. Most of the people that consume illicit substances are not committing any crimes. That's the first part. Also, those who are in jail who did commit some kind of crime, the consumption that they're most associated with is the consumption of alcohol, not marijuana or cocaine or heroin, it's alcohol. So it's very difficult because there is this link in the public debate and in the public belief that drug consumption is associated with violence intrinsically. But in reality, the way in which violence and illicit substances are linked it has to do with the existence of uh, illicit markets, not because of illicit use. So we need to do away with them, we need to regulate them, but there's a lot of work that has to be done to build different narratives about the use of substances. The other question that I think answers another question that was raised has to do with whether or not um, business people might have some interest in changing uh, the situation. I think we have seen this in the United States too, but we have to be very careful because regulation can't simply substitute an oppressive system, the prohibi prohibition system. And let's just turn that over to the capitalist system <clears throat> where the farmers in our countries uh, are going to be excluded from the legal market. So there's a huge discussion to be had in terms of marijuana, where it's not just the regulation that Canadian pharmaceutical countries uh, companies propose, for example, the traceability of <clears throat> seeds where farmers in Oaxaca and Guerrero <clears throat> would be excluded because the pharmaceutical industry would have a total mon monopoly on the production of a regulated substance. So we need to be sure that what happens doesn't happen just for the benefit of the big corporation. Any kind of regulation has to be accompanied by social justice. Regulation on its own uh, could be positive to switch from prohibition to regulation, but it also has to have an element of social justice. And finally, in one minute, Coletta, in terms of David's question, I think that militarization of all of these spaces has to do with the fact uh, that there are hard iron fist policies because we don't have a very good idea of what citizen security should look like. <coughs> Rather than <coughs> treating uh, when they treat violence, they treat institutions rather, or protect institutions rather than protecting human beings. So as long as the state is protecting itself rather than its citizens, we'll continue to have this problem. Thank you, Catalina. Now we will go to Betty. Yes. Well, our system here, what I've always said is that the, the first person that has harmed incarcerated people and their family members is not just the judicial system. There's a single person it's, it's, the, it's the criminalization on the part of the police. The police are the ones who decide what they're gonna charge you with and why. And in our institutions, there's a lot of corruption, a huge amount of corruption. So as Women United for Freedom, as Andreas says, we are the voice of people who have been silenced for so long, not just starting recently, but for forever we've been silenced. So we had to go to jail to understand this situation of the drug policies and how they work. And it wasn't just me, but also my son. Uh, he ended up in the worst position after coming out of jail. He was not an addict. He was not a 
consumer, but being in jail turned in, him into a consumer. He felt he had to do that to survive. He's trying to recover now. But as I said, within prison, there is no social rehabilitation. There is simply incarceration and treating human beings like animals. That's how I see things after having been involved in the penitentiary system. Thank you very much, Betty. I'm very sorry to hear about your son. That's very tragic. Um, we will turn now to Juliana. I'll just answer one of the questions. I'll just add a little bit because I certainly agree with what Catalina and Betty have said. Interpreter apologizes. I'm not getting a clear feed. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Juliana. Adelante, Juliana. So I just wanted to add one element, which I think is very important when we think about criminalization in Brazil, because the criminalization campaigns and the stereotypes about drug consumers and the effects of drugs have really affected us negatively. And these things were very strong in Brazil in the 1990s. These campaigns were carried out primarily by religious Protestant organizations, and they've had a direct impact on national policy. And this is something that we need to discuss and to go into greater depth on. There is a conversation about this happening in Afro communities and in other communities, and it's not easy. I'm going to share my personal experience because I had a conflict having to do with legalization and the ending jails in my own home with my mother and my grandmother. I think there's not really a magic bullet here to do away with stereotypes, but we do have to have as many conversations as possible and to widen these debates with a strong focus on the National Congress and Congress people. And we need to uh, support candidates who will be supporting our positions. Uh, we need to be able to send them data. One example is that in spite of the con, uh, conservatives, there is a discussion in Brazil about the medicine, medicinal use of cannabis. And this is happening in spite of the conservatives. This conversation is advancing because there is there's a strong relationship between research and political organization of Afro-descendant groups. It's not our ideal solution here at all, but it is at least a way to talk about the use of certain substances in a more objective way. So I use my personal example that today after many conversations and debates, my grandmother also now believes that we should legalize the use of certain substances and that we should tax them. And so we have a very important uh, job to do away with myths and to have better conversations in our communities. These communities are being impacted and uh, by these repression efforts. I would just like to address Catherine's um, question. Catherine Hurd is, is a terrific researcher from the Institute for Criminal Policy Research. And I encourage all of you to look up uh, the 
the academic work that they are producing and her um, institute is also responsible for the World Prison Brief, which all of us depend on so much um, for uh, data on people in prison across the world. And I think that, you know, at least in the context of Latin America, you know, SED has done a lot of research on drug laws in prison, but we really need a lot more academic research um, mm -hmm. on, on women and men. I don't, I don't want to just be exclusive to women. You know, who is in prison? We know from our own studies, or our, better to say, our, you know, we know from going into prison <clears throat> what the, the profile is of people in prison and that they tend to be, you know, all from situations of different kinds of vulnerability um, and the racial element that Juliana has talked to um, and, and um, documented so well. But in many countries of the region, we just don't have actual academic research data, investigations data on who these people are, what happens to them in prison, do they have access to uh, programs for rehabilitation or not, and then what happens when they come out. And, and I think tracing both um, or documenting both the, the profile of people in prison and um, how little opportunity there is in so many countries of the world, and particularly in Latin America, for support for people coming out of prison and um, how providing some support can be so important for getting their, their lives back on track. So I think I do, th the answer is there is a tremendous amount that we should be doing to, um, uh, to try to document better, you know, what are the dynamics at play around um, incarceration and, and um, punitive drug policies, not just in Latin America, but around the world. But I think, um, you know, in, in the global south is where um, you have some great research going on, but where much more um, we would we would like to support much more research, uh, particularly in Latin America. So I will close it there. We've gone over time. Um, I really want to thank our our participants. Um, you have all just been amazing. I think we've really um, done an excellent job of covering um, the issues uh, created by punitive drug laws across the region. We've had a good discussion of um, how to resist those policies and how to think differently about uh, thinking outside the box um, from uh, an, an anti-prohibitionist, abolitionist point of view <clears throat> as to what, what a different world might look like. And so, as I note, I just want to conclude by um, saying, um, the, or as I noted at the beginning, this is the third in a WOLA webinar series, Decades of Damage Done, The Drug War Catastrophe in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have three more seven, uh, webinars coming up over the next three months. They will focus on the drug war and police violence, the drug war and militarization, and the drug war and organized crime and corruption. So to the question about corruption, you will have a whole seminar about that. Um, the next one will be announced shortly, so please stay tuned um, to the WOLA webpage uh, or social media to find information about the upcoming events. And just a thank you to the audience for sticking with us this whole time. I know there were some issues with live streaming at the beginning, and thank you so much to all of the wonderful participants um, and for taking the time to be with us today, Catalina, Betty, uh, Juliana, and Andrea. Thank you very much. Gracias a ti, Coleta. Adiós. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, adiós.